Stefan Nyström, Administrative Director uh, of the Swedish Environmental um, Policy Commission. It's a very long word here. It's a very, it's a and you've totally been uncommunicable. Co totally uncommunicable. In, prior to this, you've been the Chairman of the Board of Svensk Friluftsliv, uh, Principal Secretary of the Swedish Climate Commission. Lots of good titles behind you, but I'll just, oh well. I'll just uh, let you do your show. Okay. Excellent. But let's do it after the break then, or? Uh, well, there's actually no break. Start? You'll just start right away. Oh, sure. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Let's go for it. <laughs> we'll just see if the presentation's up. The presentation's up. So what are we waiting for? Uh, <laughs> I'll just take two breaths. Uh, you know, our common SG had some problems with the power generation. So we got stuck in Hesleholm for an hour and then got stuck on a small bus, not exactly a, a motorway bus. It went around every milk stop that you could imagine, but now we're here anyway. So, <laughs> hi, good to be here. Uh, cutting down to half an hour means that, I, I guess, Marco, did you say something about, you know, the situation overall in the climate in the beginning of your presentation? So we've covered that. Everybody knows what this is all about? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'll just make that shortcut then. Because normally I, I, I think it's important to remember what we're discussing here. It's just not any question, it's about the climate. And this picture is what I woke up with this morning. It was a fantastic morning up in Stockholm. Crisp air, lots of nice colors, Swedish autumn at best. But this is not exactly the best of worlds where we might be heading if we don't take this very seriously and at all costs try to combat climate change in the shape it might come if we don't bring ourselves together, work around the globe together and get a very uh, firm climate policy in place all over the globe. But I think I'll take it from here. Uh, we already see this. So let's go straight forward to the Cross-Party Committee on Environmental Issues, which is, as we said, totally uncommunicable, but still, this is us. It was born in uh, 2010 by the former Alliance government. And the meaning to launch this cross-party committee is to, to try and establish a common, common understanding and if possible a consensus of big environmental issues before uh, government goes to parliament to present propositions on what to do. So it has a broad representation of all parties in, in the Riksdag except for one. Uh, you can see soon which one is not represented, I, I think. Perhaps we're here. Uh, but I'll get back to that, to, to that. And also, the reason behind launching this commission was that there were so many debates about the environmental issues which were brought up by, by the government one by one. So instead one wanted to take big, broad uh, considerations at, at once. And it's also meant to have a broad dialogue with society at large. And that's why we have a very broad representation from business and civil society in the parliament. The ones who decide about what we actually propose to government when we're finished with our considerations concerning the long-term climate policy is uh, the political parties. Those are the ones who vote. Uh, and business and social, social society representatives and the experts that, that we also have at hand for, from the various ministries, they can only give advice, so to speak, and make their voice heard. So it's a kind of a democratic representation, but it's the political parties that decide only. And then we have some personal appointees by the chairman who also help us with, uh, well, with their expertise. And what we're supposed to do uh, until 1st of, uh, of June next year, when we're supposed to present our final report to government, is to set the goals for 2050, including its trajectory and intermediate goals for 2030 and 2040, and also decide in what form should we have a long-term climate goal for Sweden. Should it be like a climate budget? Should we have a per capita budget for each and every one? Or what, what should the form be? And I guess it's no, well, I think it's gotta be a percentage goal. Big surprise. <laughs> Say with the base year 1990, and then a percentage set up until 2050. And the range will be in between 70%, which is set as a, fl uh, as a floor by business and the uh, unions in the debate article a couple of months ago. And uh, then we have the parties that want the most, and they say 95, 95 to 100%. 
I think it's not, not a bold guess to say that we will probably have a percentage gold and accompanied by another gold that it's allowed to take action in other countries up to perhaps 10, 15, 20 percent, depending on how the political debate goes on and what the negotiations comes out with as, as a result. So it's going to be a divided gold under an umbrella with a percentage gold and then another gold which allows us to have kind of a flexibility depending on how things develop over time. Obviously, we're also going to analyze the potential need for complementary goals. I think you've heard Minus and Astrid speak about their work, considering the export potentials for lower climate impact in the world from Sweden. Then we also have the consumption uh, issue, so to speak. Do we need particular goals for those areas, or do we not? Do we need a particular goal or a special goal for the transportation sector, or not? We've had this 1,250 pages long uh, commission report on a fossil free transportation sector and still the uh, or because of that perhaps the political parties couldn't agree upon this goal should we have it or should we not but then again we will consider if we will need such goals and discuss with the politicians if they think so or not we also have the uh, directive to develop a distinct and transparent organization of the government's climate work I'll come back to that and also assess the potential benefits of the and the need for climate law in Sweden. I'll say a few words about that as well and see where we come. But this is what it's all about, actually. We have about 55 million tons of CO2 equivalents in emissions today, and we need to go down to very low levels, independent of whether it's 85%, 90%, or 95%. This is going to be a big challenge, but it's definitely doable. And here are what the emissions are all about in Sweden at the moment. So as you can see, industry account for a very large proportion of the overall emissions. And then comes domestic transportation, which is the red line just below the blue line. And then comes the energy sector with the lighter green level, agriculture. And then we have working machines. Uh, we have uh, waste dumps and we have some other minor posts as well. Um, but as you can see, there needs to be a big change. Now, perhaps you've been discussing the potential for coming to grips with the emissions from the iron and steel industry through new technologies, which are CO2-free when you develop steel or uh, when you produce steel or from iron or or not. And if we are to come down to extremely low levels, this is absolutely necessary. And for industry, there's kind of two, perhaps three choices. Either you find a new production technology which brings you steel CO2 free, so to speak, or else we'll have to choose probably the path where we pump down CO2 into geological, geological small caves, you know, the carbon capture and storage thing, which, which I'll come back to. Uh, domestic transport is obviously where we have most things in our own hands because as you also know probably most of our industry emissions they're within the EU trading system which has its goal for itself and which is which also has the price to bring down emissions and whether it will or not one could always discuss but that's not really in our hands at the moment that's more EU policy and one of the discussion issues which we'll have and I'll come back to that as well is whether or not we should include the EU ETS sector into the Swedish goal which we're going to set for the 2050. M one might also say a word or two about uh, electricity and energy. Obviously we have extremely good possibilities of producing CO2 free electricity in Sweden and whether or not we're going to continue to produce nuclear power is an issue which are, is being discussed at the moment in the Energy Commission, which is a particular commission. We, we work together with those guys, but obviously they, they will present their final report in 2017. And since we're supposed to present our, ours one year before them, it's going to be a little bit difficult to you know, get them like this together. So we'll probably just assume that Sweden will, by kind of 2030 at the latest, have no CO2 emissions left in the electricity production system. And whether or not it's going to be nuclear, uh, that will be up to them to decide, so to speak. But I don't think any politician in Sweden can say that, no, let's go back to coal, coal let's go back to oil, 
so I, I think it's fairly stable and fairly you know, I think it's going to be like that we also have the incineration uh, the reason why we have like if you see the green line six million tons from that that's waste incineration where we have a lot of plastics at the moment and we're currently importing as you probably know as well lots of household waste from Norway from Italy from the UK and we have built out our incineration capacity massively during the last few years and we're continuously doing so because uh, the owners of these establishments they they get paid for receiving the household waste from other countries to about you know it's like a hundred no not not a hundred it's 300 Swedish crowns a ton so it's 30 40 euros per ton and then of course that's very difficult to to resist <laughs> and we have a good degree of well, we do it fairly well, and in relation to if th this has had been put in, if the um, the, the uh, garbage that we're burning in these incineration plants instead would have been placed on dumps in Europe, perhaps this is a better way of using it. But then again, this is a hot issue to discuss for the future. Are we going to continue with this, or are we not? And if we are going to continue, it is going to be difficult to get down to zero CO2 emissions from from um, in the energy sector. One of the reasons why we are doing what we're doing is that the uh, National Audit Office in the OECD has looked upon the Swedish climate policy for the last 10, 15 years. They put together a SWOT team, which examined what the government had been doing and what the authorities had been doing for the last 15 years or so, between 2009 and I think 2013, and produced four reports. And a couple of the things they came up with is that we need longer sightedness, we need more flexibility, and we need more predictability. We have no long-term goal. The only goal that's set at the moment is for 2020. And you know, if the steel industry, for instance, which has very large investments and needs to write them off in long-term perspective, they need clear-cut um, directions. Where are we heading? And the OECD and the National Audit Office saw the same thing. So that's one of the reasons also why we're developing this 2050 framework. And they also saw that the availability of data and the transparency of action is not always there. You need to know why was this measure put in place and has it been effective or not? And it's not always explained by the government, the OECD and the National Audit Scheme thinks. So it needs to be more transparent. Uh, so those are things that we bring with us into the work with developing this national policy framework. A couple of decisive and or dividing issues you could read politically into this, <laughs> but also in substance matter, it's not always that clear cut and easy to say what's th what the best thing is to do. Obviously, we need this long term goal 2050 and beyond, but at what level? This is what is being discussed between the politicians and between civil society and business at large. And once again, the levels, the range that we have at hand is between 70 and 95 percent compared to 1990 to 2050. And then complementary measures, as I said, with international credits or uh, measures in other countries. I don't think going down to Lulusia, land use, land use change in forestry, that we're going to engage in heavy sinks in Sweden. You know, there is this discussion going on between, on the one hand, people who think that what's the problem? We have 55 million tons of CO2 in emissions each year, and we bind at about the same amount in the Swedish forests. So why do we need to do anything at all? And others saying that, no, no, the forests have always been there. And we need to do more since we've also you know, built up, uh, contributed to building up the CO2 um, in the atmosphere that we have at the moment. So we need to do more, and this is just cheating, and we don't know if it's going to stay there or if the forests are going to burn down, and it's tricky to, to, to actually develop a mathematic around this that we know we can trust. So we have endpoints in these discussions. But I don't think any one of the politicians at the moment are thrilled by the thought of including a sink into the Swedish goal for 2050. I think that's already out. And personally, I think that's good. And that's not to confuse with the fact that I think that we should do everything we can to increase growth in the Swedish forests, while at the same time taking into con consideration the biological diversity and other goals connected to the environment and see how much can we increase growth in the Swedish forests, not counting it into the Swedish goal, but still because it's such short time notice until 2050 and we really need to do what we can 
to, to tie as much carbon to the Swedish forests and to the Swedish land as we possibly can. So I'm personally open to a particular goal for that, but set aside from the official Swedish goal just to make an extra contribution. But that's, that's me, then again. I'm not one of the politicians, obviously. Um, yeah, carbon capture and storage. How many knows in, in here? Uh, hand up what carbon capture and storage is. You're a very well-educated crowd, thank you. So I'll skip that point. No, seriously. Should we engage in this or should we not? Uh, all emission trajectories within the EU, within uh, the IEA, and any organization that you could think of doing prognosis or you know, considerations what might happen till 2050 and what measures can we take, they bend nicely around 2035 to 2040. And how come? Because then we have developed full-scale market based that is f affordable CCS technology. That's fascinating, I think, because we don't see very much. Well, we see lots of, uh, you know, we examine the sea bottoms all over the world to see where might be good places to put the CO2 dumps, so to speak. <laughs> but, but then again, only one full scale, as I know, establishment is up and running, and that's the Saskatchewan Energy Boundary Dam. It's a big, lar it's, a, it's a large plant, all right, but you know, these are so enormously big investments, and they need to be so many, and we need to develop a grid of either pipelines or ships that go from the sites to where you put it down in the ground. So you have to start kind of yesterday, if the curves are to bend as nicely as it said in the projections for 2035. And one could also always discuss, when I, when I speak with my good friend, Svante Axelsson, who you might have heard or who might know, he says, okay, Stefan, so why would we engage in this? This is just a dump for CO2 molecules. Why don't we aim forward instead and put the money into something, you know, more profitable for the future? This is an end road. And he might be right. But then again, well, I think he is right. But then again, can we afford not to cut emissions in this way since we need to cut it now and come down till 2050? I don't know. If you do, please give me a ring afterwards or give me a mail. Because I don't know. <laughs> it's a hazardous game, huh? We're looking into uh, the EU ETS, which is divided into two completely different uh, kind of activities. On the one hand, we have price takers, steel industry, for instance, on the world market. And obviously, there's no real meaning in just shutting down plants in Sweden, and letting others expand in other places of the world instead. And then again, we also have all the incineration plants in here. Is that, is that a smart way of doing things? I think they respond to different stimuluses and different economic incentives. So maybe, we need to look at a UGTS and see if we should develop it into two or do something else. I don't know, but this is obviously a tricky issue. And should we include all the emissions in Sweden from our territory, including EU ETS establishments to 2050, or should we not? That's also one of the uh, discussions going on in, in our committee. Climate law. If you break the law, you're fined or you're put into prison. No, not really. I don't know if you know about the Climate Change Act from the UK, where many countries have taken uh, inspiration. And I think we have 90 countries having climate laws at various levels in the world today. From the fully fledged one, I'd say in UK, which really stipulates how much carbon they can use for each five period now until 2050, and who needs to do what in government and the, um, among the authorities, including to, to fulfill the what they need to achieve till other countries like uh, a neighbor to the south of Lund and Malmö, Denmark, who says that, well, we're going to develop a low carbon economy until 2050, and we're going to have an advisory council, and bye-bye, that's our law, to be a bit blunt. But still, there's a huge span in between, and we're considering if we should change the Swedish basic law, Grundlagen, because normally we have the tradition in Sweden of letting the government do whatever they want with the power given to them by the, the Riksdag after the elections. And putting into place a climate law like the one we have in the UK 
would definitely change the way we normally do things in Sweden. But then again, climate change, is that a normal thing? Is that a thing we normally do? No, it's not. So sometimes you need to look upon things really thoroughly and say, ask yourself, is this the time when we need to, to do things really differently? And I don't have the answer, but I know that we have the best expertise there is in Sweden from, the law from lawyers, from the legal side at the universities, from academy, <coughs> and also from the political science field to help us. And they all point to one thing. Yes, we need a framework climate law with strong procedural rules telling the government what to do. Not exactly how to do it, but what to do. Uh, so no government, independent of color, henceforward until 2050 or beyond, can actually just go by a free wheel during their four years. Everyone needs to do their fair share. So we'll see what happens with that. But so far, Academy says, go for climate law. Climate Change Policy Council. Uh, do you know about the Financial Policy Council that we have in Sweden? Finanspolitiska rådet. Jan Hasler is the chairman. It was introduced by uh, Anders Borg in 2007. He wanted some chewing resistance <laughs> when formulating his fiscal policy and his budget policy. They look independently. There, there's six professors from Academy, obviously, and they're looking totally independently from the side on what the government does. And then they give a yearly report saying, is this a good budgetary policy or not? Were those newly introduced taxes good or not? Could we have achieved the same goals by doing something else. So an independent view from the side where they can take a holistic view instead of you know, just taking small pieces from their particular area of responsibility like the authorities can do and has the mandate to do. And this would be, and for instance, the Minister of Finance at the moment, Magdalena Andersson, she was very fond of finance politics get audit and when she was not Minister of Finance and she, you know, took their arguments and smashed it in the head of, <laughs> of Anders Borg and said, listen to these guys, they're wiser than you, and we say the same as they do. But now she's not so fond of them any longer, because they say that you shouldn't have do what you do, you're doing with Root and Root at the moment. So she doesn't like Finance Police Care Audit. And that's exactly how Finance Police Care Audit is supposed to work. And we're looking into the possibility of having the same kind of establishment for the climate, because we need somebody to take this holistic view continuously, not just now and then, as the National Audit Authority did a couple of years ago. No one of those guys with an expertise above normal is there any longer, so there's no continuity. And unfortunately, climate change is here to stay. And we think, I think, this is needed. Let's see what the politicians think in the future. Sweden is a front runner. I only got two pictures left, if you're worried, I think. <laughs> uh, I've got a good friend, he's a professor here at uh, the University of Lund or at uh, Lunds Tekniska Högskola and he's an advisor to both the Chinese government and to uh, the Japanese government when it comes to climate policy change and energy policy change and he was actually present in the room when the highest responsible person in the High Committee in China Council presented to the Prime Minister in China his propositions for how China should act. And he talked for 50 minutes and he showed one picture the whole time. This picture. Sweden accounts for 0.16% of all emissions worldwide. That's nothing. Really, it doesn't matter at all what we do here in Sweden in the sense of affecting concentrations of CO2 gases up there in the atmosphere. Th this is going to be determined in China, in India, in Brazil, in uh, Brussels perhaps. But what Sweden can do is to be a blueprint for a green economy for the world. And that's what we have been doing. And that's why they show this picture. And that's why Sweden's actions are so important internationally. So we're really in the forefront already, but it doesn't really matter how fast we come down with our emissions. But the way we do it, if we do it wisely and show that we're creating a better society, it is better with electric cars because there's less noise. People will die 
not six months earlier from higher particle levels and higher ground near ozone levels uh, if we go by electric cars instead of the, w the cars we, we use today. 10% of, uh, of the West European gross domestic product is used to combat air pollutions. And if we electrify the transportation sector, much of this will go away. So we're building a better society by at the same time decreasing our climate impact. And if other countries could follow and we could set a good example, this will be the absolutely most important contribution that Sweden can make to the global discussion on climate change, in my mind. This is the carrying betting situation of COP21, I call it. <laughs> It has improved. If you go into to various sites, you can see that with the current pledges, we come down to a degree of, well, 2.7 degree Celsius change. I would know, Marco, if anything has happened during the last few days that you know of. No, not really. So it's improving. But look at what happens with the current policies. 3.6 degrees, that's a lot. And 2.7 won't come out of itself either because it's one thing pledging, one thing setting goals, another taking actions. That's what we need. And I think it's important, uh, how, how do we feel about this? How do we argue about this? And technology and mindset I wrote here, because, you know, the, technolo the technology is already available and it's affordable at most times. And we can, we can solve this if we want to. It is no problem coming down to almost zero emissions in the world and at the same feeding the world and at the same time having a comfortable life. But we need action. And we can't really see, look at up on everything as just costs. Because what's costs now may be something very useful. It, it's more like an investment we need to do for the future. That could easily be perceived as a cost and we can't really afford it. But then again, what's the option? If we don't do this change, what will happen then? If we continue a path of 3.7 degrees Celsius, and if sea levels rise like five meters, seven meters, or even more, how much is that gonna cost? And who's gonna pay for it? And I think it's a mindset issue, really. The technology is there. Do we wanna do it or not? It all depends on you. It all depends on us. If we want to cooperate or if we don't want to cooperate, the possibilities definitely are there. And should we let the vested interests in the fo from the fossil society, you know, take out the course for our little space vehicle, the Earth, for the future? Or should we use the best of knowledge there is? I mean, the companies that will give us the employment for the future, the companies that will so help us solve the climate issue, many of those companies are not founded yet. They don't have their say in democratic elections, but the other ones do. And I remember Lena Ayek, you know, our former Minister of the Environment, who's a good friend of mine, uh, and who actually hired me for this job <laughs> with the former government. She said that when I came down to Brussels and had done a couple of weeks or perhaps a month, she said, I was stunned because 99% of all the lobbyists lobbied for the old technologies. How do we change that? Mindset and technology. What do we want to achieve? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to speak with your neighbors about? What do you want to speak with your friends about? What do you want to, what kind of, you know, responsibility would you like to, to axle? That's what it's coming to. This is my mother, an absolutely fantastic person. She's 80 now. And the other one person is even as fantastic because it's my youngest daughter. She's 18, it's Katja, and Ulla is the older one. Speaking about future generations sometimes seems a bit obscure and it's someplace else, sometime else, and you know, it's really not here. And we take all the action and make the decisions here. That's not really true if you think about it. Because by the time Katya hopefully grows old and becomes 80 years old, we're gonna write 2077. And she's gonna be in the middle of the change of the 3.7 degrees or 2.7 degrees or two degrees, depending on our choice. And to me, this is extremely real, I can tell you. <laughs> I feel very strongly for both these ladies, one young and one old. And if you care about anything more than yourself, then we need to take common action. We need to take common 
action now. Future generations is here and now. It's not anybody else, some place else, some time else. It's here and now. That's what it's all about. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stefan Estrom. Thank you. Please step up here uh, to this table uh, next to Will me, do. and uh, I'd like to invite the pa panel members up again, Michael Rumekainen, Roger Hillingson, and Frederik Andersson, and Max Orman. Please come up and join Stefan Estrom. Thank you for your very inspiring uh, talk. Oh, thank you. I was a bit tired off the bus, but perhaps... We didn't notice that anyway. at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like just to start up. We have about just uh, roughly a little bit more than 15 minutes. So, gentlemen, please just reflect on what Frederick just uh, Stefan just presented on, on the, the work of the Milieu Mols what, what, what are your reflections? Who would like to start? Mr. Walker? Yeah, please. Uh, do you hear me now? Yes, I had do. difficulties with this earlier. That's fine. Just uh, you need to. Thank, thanks, Stefan, uh, and welcome here. Uh, thank you. Uh, fine to have you here finally. Uh, and uh, and you, you now it doesn't work. It works. Just yeah, it works. stay still. Uh, I, I would actually like to come to sort of the uh, if if I should address a, a question and uh, sort of reflect upon it, then then I would say. Uh, you said some words about w what should the climate policy framework be, uh, and we have been curious, uh, I think, about this for a couple of years, uh, what it should be. Uh, you mentioned the climate law, and, and I'm a political scientist, uh, I should say, and I have colleagues and, uh, that have recommended it, and I, I, I might have done that myself sometime uh, also. Uh, but, but if I would uh, ask you to sort of uh, talk a little bit more about what what could that be and how could it help us to sort of institutionalize what we could call a new orientation, uh, a 2050 goal and all the other th the stuff we need, which you talked about. Uh, what would, I because, and I, look, uh, I, I actually interviewed a, a, a party leader about this once some years ago. Uh, and, w and that was when the UK Climate Change Act was completely new. And then I got the response, well, this is not the way we do it in Sweden. Mm. So and, and now you say that we might need a climate law. Uh, An elaboration yeah. about the climate law. I think that's what you want, right? I'm sure there's other questions about climate law too, because so I, I was also curious. No, I'm curious too. Mm. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, well, good question. Couldn't, I couldn't and wouldn't want to jump to conclusions since I'm kind of a spider between the experts uh, and the politicians. But I could elaborate so much to say that um, I think it really should be very much considered if it's not time for climate law in Sweden. And I say that because the other way of doing things, it's obvious both when it comes to the, um, what the OECD has said and what the national audits have said, that we need a more flexibility and we need a long-terminess that we don't have at the moment. And we've tried the other ways before. We've tried, you know, in the Richtings proposition, it's difficult to pronounce in English, mm. but it's propositions by the government that says that this is the way we want to go forward. That's not strong enough. And the next step up is a climate law. And then you can always think in terms of should we change our basic law? No, I don't think so. Not at the moment, but that's a personal view. I think we should look very closely into a climate framework law, the strong procedural rules. And what's a procedural rule? Uh, this law would imply that each government under their four period of elections, uh, election periods, they would have to present an action plan telling, are we on track or are we not? And if Checks and balances. Yeah, checks and balances. And if not on track, then, we, then they need to take more action. Mm -hmm. So that's how it could help us institutionalize the agenda. Thank you. Frederick, being an economist, what do you say? Well, uh, if it works, it would be fine. But I think the worry I have about the law is that to get seven parties to agree to it, you will water it down enormously. It will mean, mean very little. I'm much, much more into the idea of a climate policy council. Right? We can really, really put down sort of, um, when the government does something right, when it does something wrong. And, and, and with a policy council, which is correctly... Uh, built up, you can also introduce a little bit of memory into it. Because one problem we have, which the law wouldn't solve, is that you have people who are very engaged, who drive their agenda, and then they leave. And then you start with new people. And there's no memory left in the system, what we've done in the past, what we've done right, and what we've done wrong. So I think in, in, in this, this world where we live in, where we have to iterate us forward, we need flexibility and all of that. I think a policy council is definitely the way forward, more than law. Mm. 
Thank you. How much is the, uh, the, the Million Walls Beredniens work affected on the outcome in Paris? Will you just continue as, as, as planned or is it related to the outcome? We'll continue as planned, I'd say. That's the short answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Depending on what happens in Paris, but I mean, uh, we, because since we don't know, for mm -hmm. obvious reasons, because mm -hmm. it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but then again, if things happen the way they normally happen or and did happen at COP1 to tw COP20, mm -hmm. there will mm -hmm. be no very big surprises. <coughs> and Sweden will have to do our share and we have to institutionalize how we do it. So, and that's what we are doing. So it's less related to the negotiations than, mm -hmm. than perhaps the current political agenda on an everyday basis, which will depend more on what happens in mm -hmm. COP21. Speaking of, speaking of leading the way, you, you mentioned that before, could you be more specific in how we can lead the way in, in this transition of society towards a, more, uh, towards a climate neutral society, climate zero emission society? Yeah. Well, I think we can be a good example in showing that we don't take actions which just make industry leave the country and just increasing emissions at other places. But to be wise and look upon, for instance, how innovation and uh, new technology, including research, can help industries in the transition period to go on to low carbon tracks or uh, trajectories. Mm -hmm. For instance, we could put money in together, maybe it's not, isn't, it might be an idea to get put money from the government together with a combination of steel and industry, cement industry, chemical industry, into a, um, you know, a joint venture to see if CCS is the way forward for Sweden. And perhaps another way of doing the same thing is to see where is the cutting edge for new steel technology which produces steel at low carbon or low CO2 levels. And some other people here know more about that than I do. But perhaps jumping ahead and jumping to conclusions, maybe you should do the same with that kind of industry. Mm -hmm. And I think that could help other countries. And we should look at solutions that can be scaled up on a global level instead of just being a solution for, own, for Sweden only, mm -hmm. if we have the possibility. Mm -hmm. That's one way of, of doing it. How much do you address the, 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 the money situation? I mean, Marco spoke before, I think it was Marco, on if we don't do anything, it's going to cost much more than mm. if we do anything. Um, yes. Calculations in terms of cost, is that, is that a very key factor in your discussions? Definitely, yes. And, uh, you know, that's not an easy one, mm. <laughs> for obvious Imagine. reasons. And the Minister of Finance normally thinks one way, and the Minister of the Environment uh, normally thinks another way. That's why I brought up the issue as well, to see how do we, how do we look upon the concept of cost? What time frame are we looking at? Mm. And I think we come up with very different answers to depending on how you look upon it. Mm -hmm. Any reflections from the panel? No, I think just on, on the cost, obviously, if you're going to make policy, you have to do it. But it's impossible when you think about 2050 to forecast what is going to happen, what is going to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so sometimes I think we'll have to say, sit down the foot and say, well, right, we know that. If it will be three and a half degrees, it will be very, very bad. And therefore, we need to act. And we cannot just count crowns back Can you forth. use the board and draw it? Sure. Is that possible? Go ahead. I had the, the crayons. They're over here. Uh -huh. Okay, perfect. And then we'll take questions from the audience. Yeah, perfect. I'll try and be not a man and listen at the same time as I'm drawing. Mm -hmm. Oh. Didn't seem to work very well. Let's see this one. Here you go. Perfect, Black one. thanks. Uh, just to try and explain about the costs, uh, 2050 and today, we don't know if it looks, if it's going to look like this, you know, it might look like anything like this, but still, just like that. And if we, if we choose to go above like this, mm. I think we're building up an environmental debt. And if we go below, we're helping future generations to come to grips with this faster. Mm -hmm. That's the general conclusion I draw, at least from my knowledge mm -hmm. of economics and other sciences as well. Then again, if we know that it's going to be much more cheap around here, and we know this today, then it might be a good idea to wait because it might bring down costs for society. But then we really have to know that this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then again, there might be another good reason for going low faster. And that is if the price of capital is extremely low, as it is today with a negative interest rate. This is a very good reason for borrowing money from the government to go heavily <coughs> into good solutions that we have at hand, in my view, just to elaborate a little mm -hmm. bit about on Thank the cost. You. Questions, please. We have a microphone ready with Anna here. C go ahead. Um, let's take the lady in the green shirt here. Emma Krieg, Lund University. 
I was previously asking about the carbon dioxide tax, and just to comment back on that one, um, the reasons for not having it, as you brought up, uh, Fredrik, there are many solutions on that. If we would have a global carbon dioxide tax, just as one of many solutions could be to divide the costs so that one third goes back to the country that produces oil for investing in clean energy, one third goes to the consumer country, and one third to the poor, poor countries. We would quite soon invest ourselves out of it, since it would be quite clear it would be cheaper to use alternatives. Uh, so my question about that was, like, what is the real problem with introducing a carbon di dioxide tax? Has it been twisted and turned and twisted and turned until everyone is so tired o of it so they don't want to even think about it anymore? Or is it so that it's a too difficult question, so we answer a simpler one in the meantime? Thank you. And but I think we'll just stop there because we need to give room for one more. Yes, please. Stefan, would you like to answer that? You wanted to, to divide the carbon tax into three, so to speak. No, no. Why have we not uh, been able to, to Why get not go further? Globally, preferably. Next, preferably. EU. Uh -huh, I see. Next, preferably, Swedish carbon dioxide tax. Yes. Um, well, I've been doing this since 1990. I've been on all commissions, actually 13 at the moment, <laughs> I think, and <laughs> looking into these issues. Well, not all of them. There's been more than 13. But anyway, it's a tricky issue, you know, because taxation is national, and uh, lots of vested interests doesn't want the carbon tax. That's very simple. And, you know, sometimes you look upon renewable energy sources as being very heavily subsidized. It might be, it may be, I read a new figure when going down on the train, thousand billion dollars a year worldwide. But at the same time, we have five billion dollar a year in fossil fuel subsidies. And I suggest we start there instead of introducing a CO2 tax globally. I, I would love it, but it's extremely difficult to level things all over the globe and even within the EU. As we can see with another example, refugees, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to cooperate even for small amounts in relation to all those traveling over the Balkans under, serious, on, under extremely bad conditions today and to get them distributed all among the countries. This may actually sink the whole idea of the EU and still we can't agree upon it. So it is very, very difficult to do this jointly all over the globe. It's been difficult enough to get it to hold in Sweden. Yeah, no, well, I wouldn't say that we answer. Our answer is that we can't do it. There is no solution to it. <coughs> Thank you. Let's move on to a second question in the back here, the lady in the uh, pink shirt. Thank you. I'm Kerstin Holmström from Lunds Universitet. I'm um, curious about these uh, new techniques, technology, uh, this uh, photosynthetic synthesis. Uh, is there any progress on this new technology? A new technology for bioeconomics or? No, photosynthetic. Uh, the, the photosynth in Upps Uppsala, I think they have. Um, Oh, yes. Artificial uh, photosynthesis. Yeah. I'm afraid that would be a little bit out of my range. I've heard about it and I've read about mm. it, but my knowledge is very limited, so I wouldn't want to yeah. really come But I'm surprised that the politicians and fin finance people don't. Is, is there interest in this? We, we, we try to cover all areas of interest in, in terms of science. And I, I'm sure we have someone who knows a little bit more about this, but it's not at the forefront at the moment uh, because there are so many other extremely important issues that we need to deal with. The time is limited, resources are scarce, and um, that's difficult enough. But definitely the, the, the issue will come up on the agenda if it's going to be as promising as it may seem in the laboratories. I don't know more than that. Thank you. Let's take two more questions. There was one here, and let's three, exactly. One, two, three. Then we'll have to finish this afternoon. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, Jens Selander from Lund University. Um, I have uh, just one comment and one qu quick question. Um, I think that you were t is, uh, talking about disaster rhetoric, about the, um, uh, the climate uh, chaos that will ensue. And I think I would like to turn that on its head and talk about the, cr uh, the disaster rhetoric of the traditional uh, industry and the traditional vested interests that are talking about the, cl uh, the chaos that will ensue if we don't do the things that we're doing now. And especially uh, coupled to uh, both fossil fuels, as I'm in the fossil free uh, movement, uh, that uh, the fossil fuel industry are like threatening us with images of complete and utter chaos if we go fossil free, which is an interesting, uh, because we're talking about the other way around. And your but question, also question, please. Yes, sorry. Um, I think uh, th then my question is, um, role of austerity politics in uh, tackling climate change um, since 2009, um, with funding climate change, for example. Um, has that been, what's your take on that? On the funding issue or? Uh, austerity politics. Like Could the you develop on that? Um, krona for krona, no new loans for um, investing in climate, mm. uh, like very, tough economic policies all over Europe and the Western world. Thank you. Maybe somebody else in the panel would like to f reflect on austerity policies. Frederik, the economist. Uh, I think you have, for a long period of time, actually pursued economic policies quite in the wrong way. That you, move, you reduce the amount of capital spending in your budgets for a very, very long time, and you increase the amount of social spending. And with the crash and all that came, you got huge budget deficits you need to deal with because you cannot go on borrowing for consumption or redistribution all the time. Well, that obviously puts a problem because you need to reduce that, but you still don't have room to increase the amount of investments you need to make. And, and in a lot of countries, the, the debt levels are now so high that it becomes dangerous. I think Germany has a, a public debt of 90% of GDP. And there's some on that level, we begin to run into difficulties in the economy. So they don't have the space to do very much. Uh, Sweden is slightly different. Than, uh, we heard we have negative interest rates. We could issue a long-term bond with a very low interest rate and, and make sensible investment, but it has to be sensible. I think one, one thing we can discuss is that maybe we started so late that some of the investments we don't really know yet if they are sensible. So we are in the process of figuring out which investment you makes sense right now. And maybe if we start a little bit earlier, we could have had a little bit more uh, okay. investment. And most finally on this disaster, <coughs> if you say that, if you have a rhetoric that we know what we have, right? So you know what the fossil economy is. So you can't scare people that the future is terrible if you don't have it. But if you say that we, everything's going to collapse due to the climate, I think people tune out and therefore don't accept the change. So it's very, very different if you have it, if you don't have it, then you come to disaster. Rhetoric. Thank you. We had a question here from the middle and then the last one in the back. Gentleman over here, I can reach over. Try to keep it short and sweet. Thank you. Well, not sweet, but short. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, my name's Akash. I'm from Lund University. My question is related to what we discussed earlier about policy being implemented in very long time, say 10 to 15 years. How do you think changing consumption behavior through tools such as nudging is plays a role in context of Sweden, especially in like sectors like transportation and yeah. nudging. Controversial more and more. Who would like to address that? Max? Well, uh, I don't know, nudging is as being controversial. That's a, basically it's, it's the easy way of changing behavior and we do it all the time. And if you look to this twelve hundred and fifty page FFF investigation that was written, it's full of nudging proposals. They're not named nudging. Mm -hmm. They're just simply proposals to make life easier, better, and more affordable, and then with the more sustainable transport system. So, I mean, yes, it has a role to play, and we do it all the time, and we do it automatically with technology development as well. It's something we do, sort of. <laughs> basically any policy area and we do nudging mm -hmm. right we you have taxes on cigarettes on alcohol because you're not supposed to drink or smoke too much and, and, and we have incentives to get people to use more public transport and so on so there's a lot of nudging we do 
and changing consumption. If you, but if you think about changing a lot of consumption over a very long period of time, dramatically, and then more into to norms and, and working with that, and maybe one generation needs to go by before you do it. Thank you. Marco? I mean, we talked uh, earlier about this transformative change in behavior of technology and society. And nudging perhaps is the way to enable sort of successive gliding or movement in some direction. But there probably is a some, somewhere a point where nudging doesn't get us any further. And there, at the latest, you need to do transformation. You need to have done transformation so that you can go to the next regime. Um, so there certainly is a place, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. It's a bit the same as well if I just shortly comment on what I said earlier about the investments. And I mean, there's money being invested all the time with or without austerity politics. Mm -hmm. The big question is, it what is invested in and with under which principles? Um, and here the changing behavior, at least the movement which is in the investing world, uh, the initiative and so on is a very positive aspects in sort of going towards the climate rule society or zero emissions. Thank you. The final question from the gentleman over here. Let's have the microphone. Johannes, my name. I'm a Loomis student and I wanted to ask how does the committee deal or resolve the tensions between economic and environmental interests? Mm. Mm. Short and sweet. Well, being a bionic, bi bi bioeconomist myself, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I've studied both environmental management and biology, and at the same time, I've held an MBA from the Stockholm School of Economics. And uh, really, I don't think there is a very big conflict, really. Uh, we have an economic group where we have put together professors from classic economic theory school and together with ecological economics, and uh, we try and discuss all these issues that I brought up together and see what we can come up with. I think that's the best way of doing things, instead of shouting at each other and say that somebody else is too stupid and doesn't understand, it's better to sit down and see what are the real differences in views that we have. And I can't really see that we have that many differences after a while. So our, uh, our tool is to sit down and talk. Thank you. So a reflection from Marco? Well, really a question to Stefan, mm. and on changing gears a bit, I mean, what happens after 2050? Thank you. 2051. Do you say something <laughs> about uh, <laughs> what needs to be done, or do you somehow sort of see that what you suggest for 2050 still keeps us on the path or in a state towards 2100 and so on? No, this is, of course, a very good and relevant question and my simple answer is that we, we, we realize that there is a world beyond 2050. Mm. It's difficult enough to deal with the time perspective until 2050, I'm afraid. So you're not really addressing that far ahead? No. Okay. 2050 is far ahead enough. Mm -hmm. Speaking of far ahead, we have uh, extended our stay here by 35 minutes. I am very grateful that you were able to stay, and uh, most of all, I'm grateful to the gentleman up here. Should have been a lady, Annika Kronsen, that had mentioned she was taken ill too, political science uh, representative. So, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to offer you a little bit of a goodie bag here. It's, I've hidden it over here. There is a bigger goodie bag from the, uh, uh, the SC Traveler. I know there is a book and some uh, lovely chocolate for the ride home. Excellent. Thank and you. Uh, thank, you thank, you so so thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. And let's see. Fair trade, organic, of course, Valrona, dark chocolate, and not so many climate gases involved, and also Anik and Mag uh, sorry, Magnus and uh, Astrid. Um, candy for you. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, hand it to Magnus, please. Give the gentleman a warm hand again, and also for Astrid and Magnus.